Hello, everybody. I'm sorry for the delay getting out the email to you tonight. Um, there's a couple of things that went into this. Um, number one, actually, hang on, let me change the angle on this a little bit. Um, number one is lacking the ability to do daily ministry. Um, this is one of the chief ways that God talks to me uh, and makes me aware of things. He knows that I'm an experiential learner and I would make a terrible religious. I could never be a monk. Um, so it kind of kills me to not be out and doing the things that God has designed me to do. And as a result, the 10 to 15 hours of prayer that I usually put into every class um, between worrying about streams and whatnot uh, was not of as high a quality. So this class was a little bit harder for me to put together um, because normally, I mean, my day is a walk with him and he makes things known. So, um, so plus, one of you sent an email that I really want to respond to. So I deeply apologize for getting this out to you late and I will do my best to not get it out to you late in the future. Yes, I have a lesson plan that I've been following, but I kind of like to be obedient to the Holy Spirit in the week to week. And so then if it becomes clear through my conversations with you that something needs to be covered better or if there's a depth that I need to go into, then I feel a deep need to be obedient to that. And so then sometimes the lesson plan sort of goes out the window. Um, it's just obedience to God in the moment. And, and I hope that you understand this. That it's not like I've been playing video games or anything. <laughs> I wish I could. I just can't stand the things. So anyways, so let's begin the class as we always do, with the prayer at the beginning of each class. Um, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. My beloved Jesus, I believe that you are truly here present, that you hear me, that you see me, I beg pardon for my sins. Through the intercession of St. Joseph, your Father, and Mary, our Mother, I ask for the graces I will need to make this time of prayer, study, and discussion fruitful, and that through my participation in it, I will develop a deeper love for you, Jesus, and for our Mother. Additionally, I ask the grace that I will need to make this Lent truly great, and that I may truly grow in my faith through it, so that at the end I may meet you at the cross. For all these things, I pray in your most perfect name, Jesus, in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. All right, so I want to thank you again because there are a thousand different ways that you can spend time, probably less now that we're all in quarantine, but still, there are probably things that you could be doing instead of spending an hour each week with me. And I am humbled and edified by that. And I thank you deeply. Um, so let's respond to some of the emails. I didn't get as many emails as I usually do, and I wonder if that is because you've either been busy or just because the question didn't really seem to resonate with you. Please feel free to let me know. Um, I want everyone to get the best that they can out of this class. So, um, I, even though the bishop assigned it as part of my pastoral year here, um, I'm sure that he doesn't want me just talking for my own sake, and I certainly don't want to be talking for my own sake. So any way that I can make this better for you, let me know. Um, so in response to last week's class, I asked you about ways that you can kind of overcome your default setting to become more aware of people and to enter their world to help them and to be more aware of God's action in our day to day. So I got a couple of emails that I'd like to share with you. Uh, one is from Re Okerberg. She said, as an introvert, this is going to be an interesting assignment. 
So I've got this neighbor that lives across the quad from me and up on the second floor. He's a rather odd duck, but he's still a child of God, and I'm trying to remember that. He knows that I'm Catholic and that I'm serious about my faith. So he's been trying to engage me in conversations about God, and on at least one occasion, has come seeking me out for prayer for a difficult situation he said he was facing. I'm never, ever going to turn someone away if they ask for prayer. Any chance I can get to talk to someone about my beloved Jesus, I'm all about it. Tonight he texted me and told me that a gal prayed with him and gave him a beautiful rosary. He isn't Catholic, but he's curious. I remembered that there's a spare set of saint cards in a binder on my bookshelf that I found a few years ago at Ohio Thrift for a couple of bucks. Honestly, I really don't need them. I've already got the full set that you gave me, so I don't need that I gave her just recently. Um, so I don't need a spare binder of random cards that I already have, so I had an idea. Why not pass the extra binder I got at the thrift store a couple of years ago on to my neighbor? I wrote a little note sharing a little bit about saints and offered to find him information about any saints he has heard of that aren't in the binder I'm giving him. With things being so frightening right now with COVID, I figured talking to the saints helps me a lot, so why not share that same comfort with another human being who may not really have anyone that they can turn to in their downtime? when it's just them at home and no one to talk to. That's lovely, actually. Introducing somebody into a relationship with the saints is introducing somebody into a very real and life-giving relationship. It's a friendship, you know? Because ours is a God of the living, not a God of the dead. And so the fact that the saints are in heaven doesn't mean that they are any less accessible or any less real or any less perfectly relatable. It's a big part of evangelization is making the faith livable and relatable to other people. And so introducing someone to the saints, to people that have gone through, you know, great crises and borne great crosses of their own is, is a wonderful way to kind of get more out of life. So thank you for that. This one from Rita Dudgeon. She says, greetings, Deacon. This will probably be late, too, not because the dog ate it, because he really does eat everything, but because I just remembered you were sending this week's video tonight. I'm glad you remembered. I thoroughly enjoyed This Is Water. I even had my husband read it, and he's not Catholic and likes to keep a comfortable distance from talk of religion. He, too, thought it was a great reminder to think outside ourselves, because life doesn't really revolve around us. I never know or plan ahead of time. How I can make someone feel else feel better, perk them up, let them know that they are noticed, that someone sees them. I just don't think about it. I just put it on my heart that I will in some way touch someone's soul, make them aware of their importance, or just give them a break from real-time stress. Examples, complimenting anything on a stranger that stands out to me, letting someone with a few items go ahead of me in the checkout lane at the store, offering to get some, something off an unreachable shelf to someone in a motorized cart, smiling and saying excuse me when passing everyone without expecting a reply, which often happens, sad to say. It never seems like much, but maybe it lessens the stress for just one person, and then it will have been worth it. I do not know why, but random people frequently tend to talk to me in the grocery store. I simply said excuse me and smiled at an elderly gentleman one day, and he carried on a lengthy conversation about his health and upcoming surgery, his fears and concerns. I listened intently and offered to pray for him, that his surgery would go well and that he would thrive. I received the biggest smile and thank you for doing that. It was a small but sincere gesture to a stranger, and it not only lifted his spirits, but it humbled me. That's kind of the bigger point of this is water, isn't it? It's about breaking out of the autopilot that makes us slave to our wants and our desires and our most intimate thoughts and feelings right now in order to be able to perceive the real world around us. And that would include how God is acting, asking us to act. And that would include being perceptive to people that are in need of us. And yeah, something as innocent as a conversation about something nice that somebody's wearing can, it might be the only real human contact that somebody's had for a long time. I remember once I was going for a walk through Hilltop, which is kind of a, considered to be a shady part of town, but it's, it's my hometown, so 
Um, and there was this guy just sitting on his front steps, looking like the end of the world. You know? And and I asked him. I said, "Is everything going okay?" And he looks at me. and says, "No." And I said, "Okay. Would you, would you like to talk about it? Because I got time." And he says to me, "No, I wouldn't." But it made me really happy to know that you care. And I said, I really do. I'll, I'll sit down, you know, I'll go buy you dinner or something and we can, we can talk. And he said, no, just thanks for caring. You know, even though I didn't get to accomplish the thing that I wanted, I got to accomplish the thing that God wanted, right? Which was just to let somebody know that they matter in just some little way. And so, Rita, I think you've got, I think you're out on the right, uh, you know, train of thought, right? That breaking out of ourselves means being perceptive to others. And being perceptive to others is a way of letting them know that they have value and worth. And that can completely change their day. Innocent little conversations in a grocery store. I was on the phone with a friend. So a while back, you guys remember, I went on a retreat with Opus Dei in Valparaiso, Indiana. And after the retreat was over, because it's so close to Chicago, and I have a great love for all things Chicago, which is a long story, I'll tell you some other time if you actually care. Um, and so I had, I had to stop by the store and pick up some Italian beef so that I could share it with my friends and with Father Hammond and potentially Father Olvera. And I'm on the phone with a friend and this lady was just buying some Italian beef and I asked her, you know, oh, is this a good brand? You know, just innocent little conversation. But like, that seems so hard nowadays when everyone is so busy, right? Like, God forbid you actually have a conversation with somebody about, like, are you in that much of a rush, right? And it spawned this like 10 minute long conversation about Italian beef, which is a, another kind of like a really important cultural thing in Chicago. That, I'll explain to you sometime if you actually want to hear. Um, and my friend was just kind of like in awe, right? Like, how do you do that? How do you just like talk to random people? And it's like, you know, they're just as interesting as anybody else, you know? And if I really want to enjoy my day, then that's going to include allowing people into it so that I can just kind of rejoice in them, you know, and how interesting they are and in their, their stories. I love stories. You guys know this. Um, so, thank you, Rita. Now, this one comes from Barb McComb, and I asked her if I could share it in its entirety, and she said yes. Um, and I want to respond to it. Um, I'll read it first, and then we'll respond. Because of my default settings, I knew early in life how I wanted to reach out to others who perhaps daily experience some or all of the same defaults that I dealt with and sometimes still struggle with. Rejection, isolation, loneliness, sense of not belonging, worthlessness. Without going into a great deal of detail about my childhood and my life's journey to this point, I've had to overcome many roadblocks. People can be quite cruel and judgmental about something they don't understand and don't care to learn about. Instead, they find fear easier than knowledge. My mother was very controlling. She could be very hurtful with her words and actions. My parents both worked, so most of the time I was restricted to our home. At age 10, I was diagnosed with diabetes. At that time, not a lot was known about how to control the disease. The lack of understanding of the diabetes and its long-term implications created fear for my mother, as it was something she could not control and there. In turn, she created a more restricted life for me. My mother's decisions to share her perceptions of diabetes with family, classmates, and others resulted in the rejection by and loss of what few friends I previously had. After a while, I became quite comfortable with being alone. After all, I would not need to deal with the, rejection, with the pain of rejection, though secretly I would have loved to have had even one friend. My father was the opposite of my mother. He was my friend, guardian, and as much as possible, my protector from all the negativity. Later in life, he helped me move through some of the pain, 
He talked to me about not being a victim and how to take my life experiences and figure out ways to be there to help others by offering them what I desired the most, acceptance and unconditional love. My walk with God has taught me how to listen to him when he speaks. He has shown me through the gift of the Holy Spirit how to open myself to the worlds of others by bringing communion to the homebound, visiting those in nursing homes, and establishing a bereavement ministry within our church. By becoming involved in these and other act works of charity, I pray that in some small way, I've been able to let people know they matter, they are not alone, and they are cared about and loved. This is the part that I want to kind of unpack, this next paragraph. And the reason why I want to unpack it, as I've said before to you guys, the relationship between somebody that's teaching and somebody that is giving time out of their day to learn is, is a sacred thing, especially when we're talking about the faith, right? And so I am infinitely grateful, more than words can express, in as much as I'm capable of expressing. Um, I'm grateful for the constructive criticism that I receive from you guys. It gives me, it teaches me how to be a better teacher. It will, God willing, make me a better priest. And it gives me a chance to respond. And I'm grateful for that. So she says, you often say that we cannot experience someone else's pain, but I view that differently. We have all experienced pain in our life. When we cut ourselves, it hurts. The intensity of the pain depends on how deep the wound is. I believe that only by experiencing pain can we help others. Blessings and, okay, there we go. Um, so I want to respond to that. So, number one is there is an incredible value of suffering in the Christian life. And I've actually included some reading from the Curia of Ars, uh, from what was called the Little Catechism of the Curia of Ars. And he has a, spe a specific catechism on suffering, which we'll get to in a minute, right? But the fact of the matter is, is that when God allows us to bear crosses when God either intervenes or chooses not to intervene in my life. You know. It's largely because it is the best way to effect our salvation. Okay. And so that means that every cross is kind of custom tailored to the person. And there are some crosses that it's hard to wrap your head around how that might work. And some crosses that are terrible injustices. And I want to make that clear. That's not saying that it's easy to see these things as gift. Because some of the particularly terrible ones, the human mind is boggled. Um, and to that end, Pope St. John Paul II wrote a great encyclical called On the Mystery of Human Suffering, which is worth reading. Um, but that said, so if I'm going to unpack that statement in terms of my conversations with you guys, so I was first diagnosed with leukemia, for example, in 1985, and I relapsed in late 1990. Now, I had acute lymphocytic leukemia, but the fact that I had acute lymphocytic leukemia does not mean that my eight years of experience of acute lymphocytic leukemia is the same as somebody else's, different family situations, different lives. That does not mean that the pain is unrelatable, right, or that the suffering is unrelatable, but rather we have to break you have to think of it a little bit like somebody sets a big pie in front of you, okay? Well, you don't just throw a whole pie into your mouth, right? You attack the pie by pieces, right? So you cut a little slice off, take a bite, you chew, and when you're done chewing, you cut the pie out again. And so when I say you can't really feel somebody else's pain, what I mean is not that 
you're bearing a similar cross is unrelatable because of course it's relatable. It's a cross. Um, but what I mean is that if you're really going to be able to gain some insight into the person, your insight into the person has to not be based in insight of yourself. Because they are going to view the same kind of traumatic experience in a different way. They're going to perceive it in a different way. They might perceive its value in a different way. And so when we break our experiences of bearing crosses into pieces, then we can take the piece after having digested it and say, okay. So for example, you know, if I wanted to start a conversation with somebody else that has leukemia, I'm a big fan of that must be statements, right? Or you must be statements. Because you must be is not me trying to tell them what they're feeling. You must be is kind of permission for them to say yes or no and fill in the blanks in my understanding, right? And so I could say you must be having a hard time dealing with the terrible burden of chemo. That opens a conversation rather than, I know what you're going through, I've been there, right? Which the point is, is that I'm not you. So I haven't been in your exact spot and I'm not bearing your cross, which is custom tailored for you, right? Um, and to that end, uh, I've included an excerpt from chapter three of Johan Hari's book called Missed Connections, which really, it proposes to talk about depression, but really it's talking about missed connections in terms of understanding other people's suffering, okay? And the chapter is called chapter three, The Grief Exception. Um, ironically, learning that depression and anxiety are not caused by a chemical imbalance made me feel unbalanced. Somebody once told me that giving a person a story about why they are in pain is one of the most powerful things you can ever do. Taking away the story for your pain is just as powerful. I felt like I was on a rocky ship and somebody had taken away the railings. I began searching for another story. It was only some time later when I first spoke with a woman in Arizona named Joanne Cacciatore that I began to see the first thread of a different way of thinking about this problem, one that would transform the journey I was about to take. And I specifically selected this reading because of one of you responding to me. And since I haven't had time to ask permission to share their story, I'm going to leave it up to them as to whether or not they want to share it, right? But the high notes are we were talking about the relatability of crosses. Uh, and I was talking about a friend for whom the experience of losing a child is still very much a weight on their shoulders years and years and years and years after. And the, the person said to me something along the lines of, yeah, I, I know what that's like. And they described their own experience of loss. And I said, well, that's, and I thank them for sharing that. And I said, one of the biggest struggles that my friend had was the feeling that their body had betrayed them. And like they were defective as a woman. And this person says to me, well, I never felt that. Right? This is the danger of believing that the cross that we have borne is entirely relatable in itself to somebody else's cross. Okay, Is your personal experience is going to be very different than somebody else's. Oh honey, Joanne's doctor said to her, you just need some attention. She'd been having extremely painful contractions for three weeks and she thought she needed help. She was very diligent during her pregnancy. She wouldn't even chew gum with aspartame in it, 
because she was worried it might harm her baby. So she kept insisting, these are really powerful contractions. They don't feel normal to me. But the doctor insisted right back to her, it's normal. When she finally did go into the hospital to give birth, I'd had three other children, so I knew what the labor room was supposed to sound like, she says. And so she sensed quite quickly that there was something wrong. There was chaos all around her, and the medical team was visibly panicked. She would have a contraction that lasted for a minute, then 30 seconds later, she'd have another contraction. As she pushed as hard as she physically could, they told her that, she, that they had lost the baby's heartbeat. She tried to push even more violently, and she felt like she was leaving her body and looking down on herself. I remember looking at myself. My legs were shaking, just shaking. I couldn't stop quivering. I had my eyes closed tightly when she was born because I was going to get her out as quickly as I could. As soon as the baby emerged, the doctors made a decision without asking Joanne not to try to revive her. They handed her to Joanne's then husband, and he said gently to her, we have a beautiful little girl. At that moment, I just sat up, Joanne told me years later. I became a mother to her in that moment, and I reached my hands out. I said, give her to me. She was perfect. She was eight pounds. She had rolls of fat under her cheeks. Her little wrists had little rolls of fat, and he put her in my arms. She just looked asleep. It was a strange juxtaposition of birth and death that coalesced in a single moment and that would change the course of my life. Now, I will tell you, she said to me, I've had a lot of loss in my life. Before I even turned 40, I'd lost both my parents. I lost my best friend, but I never expected to lose my daughter. That's something I just couldn't have prepared myself for. It's just unfathomable. Three months after her daughter died, Joanne weighed 88 pounds. I wasn't sure I was going to make it, she said. It felt like I was dying. Every day I would open my eyes, if I slept, and say, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. I don't want to feel like this anymore. I can't do this anymore. The autopsy was inconclusive. She didn't have any congenital problems. My best guess is that I think my body was trying to go into labor, but I wasn't dilating. The only thing I could think of is that my body killed her, just literally suffocated her to death. So I had a pretty acrimonious relationship with my body for a long time, as you can imagine. The only person I had to blame was me, my body. I was supposed to do one thing, give birth to this healthy baby, and she was healthy, so it wasn't her problem. It was my problem. Something in my body failed. I used to call my body Judas because it felt like I felt like it betrayed her and thus me. Right. And so now when I'm talking about cutting the cake into pieces, right? While my experience with cancer was 8 years long and it was big and compact. And the initial thinking might be I have nothing to offer this person because I didn't lose a baby, right? But hearing those words, I felt like my body betrayed me. Well, I know what that's like. I lost the ability to walk. It took me two and a half years of physical therapy to be able to walk again. If you notice, here's a fun little fact, right? If you notice when I walk, I tend not to swing my arms when I walk, right? I don't do this like normal people. And that's because when people learn to walk a second time, when their nervous system is more developed, they tend to learn to balance themselves not by swinging their arms, but by rolling their shoulders, right? So I was actually in ROTC in high school, and I actually had to learn how to uh, swing my arms when I walked. That way I could march and not look weird. <laughs> uh, you still don't want to see me run because I don't swing my arms when I run either. Um, but the point being, right, as a sidebar, um, the point being, I know what it's like to feel like my body has betrayed me. And I know what it's like to feel like I have a defective body, right? Because I spent a long time sick, and all I wanted to be was well. Like that's, that's a common struggle. And so even though our crosses are very different, when you unpack the cross, 
there are similar experiences that are then relatable to other people. And so even if, say for example, you lost a child in childbirth, you had a stillborn baby, and even if your experience included feelings of having a defective body and theirs didn't, right? There's still commonality in the way that the world responds. Because the way that the world responds is with stupid and meaningless and superficial consoling things. So people say things like, well, you can try for another baby soon, right? I mentioned this before in a previous class, but that's, that's not, that's not my baby, that's, that's not Michael or Cindy or whatever her name was, right? You can never have you know, another Tiffany. You can never have another Brittany. You can never have, it's that one. They're unique and they're precious. People aren't replaceable, right? And so even if your experience is different in that it manifested a different way, there's still some common element that you can then create this powerful relation to this other person by validating their experiences. Because I'll tell you something, a common thing that people are suffering deal with, a common thing that people who are genuinely suffering deal with is a feeling that they don't have a right to their emotional inventory. Or feeling like they're crazy because they aren't getting better, right? Oh, you should just get over that. That's another stupid thing that we say all the time. We tell somebody that's grieving the loss of a child, well, it's been 10 years, get over it, right? And the Johan Hari book kind of even addresses this too, right? Um, far from being irrational, Joanne says, the pain of grief is necessary. I don't even want to recover from her death, she said about her daughter Cheyenne. Staying connected to the pain of her death helps me to do my work with such a full, compassionate heart and to live as fully as she can. I integrated that guilt and shame that I felt and the betrayal by serving others, she said to me, with some of the horses she's rescued running in a field behind her. So in a way, my service to others is how I remunerate. It's my way of saying sorry to her every day. I'm sorry I did not bring you safely into the world. And because of that, I'm going to bring your love into the world. It made her understand the pain of others in a way she couldn't before. It makes us stronger, she says, even in my vulnerable places. Right. And so part of the challenge of overcoming our default mode of thinking is that we who have suffered immediately kind of want to search, leap to answers. Well, this helped me, you know. Or what you need to do is X. Um, maybe that's what helped you, right? But there's much more value in giving that person voice and letting them actually say what they're going through and helping them navigate the ecosystem of their own thoughts. Um, that's the best way that I can, or anybody can relate to somebody else that's suffering, right? Um, now, that's on the relatability of suffering, so let's talk about St. John Vianney and his catechism on suffering. That is, chapter 18 is the heading, right here. Right, because A, suffering can be a gift because it can connect us, the experience of suffering, the feeling, the perception of pain can connect us to other people. And so there's a universality of pain, right? If we're honest about it, if we allow ourselves to unpack it. And that's where Milagros kind of came into play, right? Because Milagros is a step in understanding God's intervention in trying circumstances. And when we unpack those experiences, instead of running from them, it gives us this tremendous opportunity to, to meet others in the midst. So even if you haven't lost a baby, if you know any suffering in your life, which, you know, unless you're a, you know, a DuPont millionaire or something, I've, you've probably had some very real suffering in your life. Um, 
there's still something for you to offer because you know how it made you feel. And you know how then to at least lift a little bit of the veil that they're hiding behind in their suffering. And that can be life giving. But also there's value in suffering because it unites us with that guy. Um, and St. John Vianney says, whether we like it or not, we must suffer. There are some who suffer like the good thief and others like the bad thief. They both suffered equally, but one knew how to make his sufferings meritorious. He accepted them in the spirit of reparation, and turning towards Jesus crucified, he received from his mouth these beautiful words, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. The other, on the contrary, cried out, uttered imprecations and blasphemies, and expired in the most frightful despair. There are two ways of suffering, to suffer with love and to suffer without love. The saints suffered everything with joy, patience, and perseverance because they loved. As for us, we suffer with anger, vexation, and weariness because we do not love. If we loved God, we should love crosses. We should wish for them. We should take pleasure in them. We should be happy to be able to suffer for love of him who lovingly suffered for us. Of what do we complain? Alas, the poor infidels who have not the happiness of knowing God and his infinite loveliness, have the same crosses that we have, but they have not the same sweet consolations. You say it is hard? No, it is easy. It is consoling, it is sweet, it is happiness. Only we must love while we suffer, and suffer while we love. On the way of the cross, you see, my children, only the first step is painful. Our greatest cross is the fear of crosses. We have not the courage to carry our cross, and we are very much mistaken. For whatever we do, the cross holds us tight. We cannot escape from it. What then have we to lose? Why not love our crosses and make use of them to take us to heaven? But on the contrary, most men turn their backs upon crosses and fly before them. The more they run, the more the cross pursues them, the more it strikes and crushes them with burdens. If you were wise, you would go to meet it like St. Andrew, who said, when he saw the cross prepared for him and raised up into the air, Hail, O good cross, O admirable cross, O desirable cross, receive me into thine arms, withdraw me from among men, and restore me to my master who redeemed me through thee. Listen attentively to this, my children. He who goes to meet the cross goes in the opposite direction to crosses, he meets them, perhaps, but he is pleased to meet them. He loves them. He carries them courageously. They unite him to our Lord. They purify him. They detach him from this world. They remove all obstacles from his heart. They help him to pass through life as a bridge helps us to pass over water. Look at the saints. When they were not persecuted, they persecuted themselves. A good religious complained one day to our Lord that he was persecuted. He said, O Lord, what have I done to be treated thus? Our Lord answered him. And I, what had I done when I was led to Calvary? Then the religious understood. He wept, he asked pardon, and dared not complain any more. Worldly people are miserable when they have crosses, and good Christians are miserable when they have none. The Christian lives in the midst of crosses as the fish lives in the sea. And then let's skip a little bit. If the good God sends us crosses, we resist, we complain, we murmur. We are so averse to whatever contradicts us that we want to be always in a box of cotton. But we ought to be put into a box of thorns. It is by the cross that we go to heaven. Illnesses, temptations, troubles are so many crosses which take us to heaven. All this will soon be over. Look at the saints who have arrived there before us. The good God does not require of us the martyrdom of the body. He requires only the martyrdom of the heart and of the will. Our Lord is our model. Let us take up our cross and follow him. Let us do like the soldiers of Napoleon. They had to cross a bridge under the fire of grape shot. No one dared to pass it. Napoleon took the covers, marched 
took the colors, marched over first, and they all followed. Let us do the same. Let us follow our Lord who has gone before us. It is through the exercise of the Milagros and the Tablos, it is through the sanctification of memory that we are able to really truly process the gift of the cross. It's how we're able to recognize our assignments of Cyrene, and it's how we're able to enter into the depth of the procession to Calvary. Because our Lord didn't need assignment of Cyrene. Through all of it, he was still the second person of the Trinity. He could have blinked his eyes and healed every single muscle fiber, every damaged skin cell. He could have just been complete and intact. But he allowed St. Simon of Cyrene to help to carry the cross. Because part of the value of experiencing the cross is recognizing the necessity of helping other people to carry their crosses. At the same time, even the event of carrying a cross needs to be unpacked, kind of like cake. Because a cross teaches us many, many things, right? A cross can teach us, you know, unpacking that moment, that milagro, that retablo, can reveal to us the good people that God sends into our lives in order to help us make it through okay. It can help us be aware of heaven's intervention for us can help us be aware of the closeness of the saints, of the Virgin Mother, of our Lord. At the same time, as we continue to unpack it, even in retrospect, right, even across that we suffered meaninglessly in the past, we can allow God to sanctify our memory. Because God exists out of space and time. He can sanctify anything that he wants, even things that have happened in our past. And so, Lord, help me to understand the value of this cross that I've carried. Help me to unpack it and make sense of it and learn how to cooperate with it. It's a perfectly valid and praiseworthy prayer. And, you know, it brings out the depth of that thing that we sometimes say to people that are suffering. Or we either say, offer it up, or we say, you know, offer it up in union with Christ which kind of feels like a meaningless thing to say. And on the, for the most part, the people that say it, for the people that say it, it's a meaningless thing to say, right? But when we allow ourselves to come to a deeper love of Christ who is innocent and suffered, when we ourselves have been innocent and suffered, right? And then to recognize all the little Christs out in the world who are innocent and who suffer, Tremendous gift. Right. Um, I'm running short on time now. I'm at 43 minutes, so I've got 15 minutes left. So what I want to introduce today is the idea of making a good confession. Right. And we as Catholics, we tend to think that we know how to do that. And meditating, spending some time on what it means to make a good confession is another good Lenten practice. Because as things become habit for us, we do them without thought. And if we're doing confession without thought, then it's time to reclaim confession. Right. So this one's chapter 17, Catechism on Confession. And we're gonna use Robert Bellarmine uh, some of his work next. Okay. My children, as soon as you ever have a little spot upon your soul, you must do like a person who has a fine globe of glass, which he keeps very carefully. If this globe has a little dust on it, he wipes it with a sponge the moment he perceives it. And if there's the globe clear and and there is the globe clear and brilliant. In the same way, as soon as you perceive a little stain on your soul, take some holy water with respect and do one of those good works to which the remission of venial sins is attached, an almsgiving, a genuflection to the Blessed Sacrament, hearing a Mass. My children, it is like a person who has a slight illness. 
He need not go and see a doctor. He may cure himself without. If he has a headache, he need only go to bed. If he is hungry, he has only to eat. But if it, but if it is a serious illness, if it is a dangerous wound, he must have the doctor. After the doctor come the remedies. In the same way, when we have fallen into any grievous sin, we must have recourse to the doctor, that is, the priest, and to the remedy, that is, confession. My children, we cannot comprehend the goodness of God towards us in instituting this great sacrament of penance. If we had had a favor to ask of our Lord, we would never have thought of asking him that. But he foresaw our frailty and our inconstancy in well-doing, and his love induced him to do what we should not have dared to ask. If one said to those poor lost souls that have been so long in hell, we're going to a place a priest, we're going to place a priest at the gate of hell. All those who wish to confess have only to go out. Do you think, my children, that a single one would remain? The most guilty would not be afraid of telling their sins, nor even of telling them before all the world. Oh, how soon hell would be a desert, and how heaven would be peopled. Well, we have the time and the means which those poor lost souls have not. And I am quite sure that those wretched ones say in hell, O oh, accursed priest, if I had never known you, I should not be so guilty. It is a beautiful thought, my children, that we have a sacrament which heals the wounds of our soul, but we must receive it with good dispositions. Otherwise, we make new wounds upon the old ones. What would you say of a man covered with wounds who is advised to go to the hospital to show himself to the surgeon? The surgeon cures him by giving him remedies. But behold, this man takes his knife, gives himself great blows with it, and makes himself worse than he was before. Well, that is what you often do after leaving the confessional. My children, some people make bad confessions without taking any notice of it. These persons say, I don't know what is the matter with me. They are tormented and they do not know why. They have not that agility which makes one go straight to the good God. They have something heavy and weary about them which fatigues them. My children, that is because of sins that remain, often even venial sins for which one has some affection. There are some people who indeed tell everything, but they have no repentance, and they go at once to Holy Communion. Thus the blood of our Lord is profaned. They go to the Holy Table with a sort of weariness. They say, yet I accused myself of all my sins. I do not know what is the matter with me. There is an unworthy communion, and they were hardly aware of it. My children, some people again profane the sacraments in another manner. They have concealed mortal sins for ten years, for twenty years. They're always uneasy. Their sin is always present to their mind. They're always thinking of confessing it and always putting it off. It is a hell. When these people feel this, they will ask to make a general confession, and they will tell their sins as if they had just committed them. They will not confess that they have hidden them during ten years, twenty years, that is a bad confession. They ought to say besides that they had given up the practice of their religion, that they no longer felt the pleasure they had formerly in servicing the good God. My children, my children, we run the risk again of profaning the sacrament if we seize the moment when there is a noise around the confession to tell the sins quickly which give us most pain. We quiet ourselves by saying, I accused myself properly, so much the worse if the, confessioner, if the confessor did not hear. So much the worse for you who acted cunningly. At other times we speak quickly, profiting by the moment when the priest is not very attentive to get over the great sins. Take a house which has not been for a long time very dirty, which has been for a very long time very dirty and neglected. It is in vain to sweep out. There will always be a nasty smell. It is the same with our soul after confession. It requires tears to purify it. My children, we must ask earnestly for repentance. After confession, we must plant a thorn in our heart and never lose sight of our sins. We must do as the angel did to St. Francis of Assisi. He fixed in him five darts, which never came out again. And so in the same way that we can unpack prior memories in order to become more aware of God's providence, things that used to be afraid, you know, now there's peace because we recognize God's providence in the moment. In the same way, it's necessary to unpack our sins, right? 
It's not good enough to say, I had harsh words to my brother. Why? Was it envy that excited you to say harsh words to your brother? Was it pride that excited you to have harsh words against a brother? If I'm trying to overcome my default wiring, if I'm trying to be more aware of the things that are going on around me and of the things that are going on inside of me, then why do I have harsh words for my brother at all? Why am I not listening to my brother? Why am I not letting him tell his story devoid of any of my sarcasm? Sarcasm which I have no right to. Because sarcasm is nothing more than frozen anger. And sarcasm about another person is itself worthy of confession. Okay? And so those of you who have your packets, those of you who don't, don't worry, I'm going to attach it to this email, have the confession from Father John Harden. Right? And here, it looks silly and superficial, but there's a tremendous depth to be unpacked in using this as a model for confession. Right? It's perfectly worthy to make a confession based on this. Do I ever tempt God by relying on my own strength to cope with the trials in my life? As in, is there a trial coming up and I think I'm going to outsmart it? You know? Or do I humbly pray and ask God to help me navigate this? Right? And we think, well, you know, pride's not a mortal sin, right? It's not, right? But pride very often times masks idolatry. Let's be honest. A good and holy priest, mentor of mine, was fond of telling me that the more that I persevere in the spiritual life and the more that I grow in my vocation, the more that I will recognize that at the root of every sin we commit is the first commandment, a violation of the first commandment. You shall love the Lord your God. With, you know, it's right there. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. Is God my recourse or am I my recourse? If I'm my recourse, then it's worth con confessing at least a venial sin. It's worth unpacking, you know. So I had harsh words with my brother. Well, why was that, right? Because, well, when I went to go see my brother, I was thinking how clever I was going to be and I was going to win an argument finally. Why does it matter? You know. Why would I not care more deeply about doing what God wants me to do? Why would it not matter to me to pray before I go see my brother who I have difficulty with and asking the Lord for an ability to overcome difficulty with my brother? Or asking the Lord for the humility so that I can really unpack what the root of that difficulty is with my brother. It's another mode of overcoming our default wiring, right? We've learned how to unpack the fearful things that have happened to us in the past to uncover God's providence and care. We should devote as much time to unpacking our sins so that we can make a good confession, a humble confession, an honest confession that isn't just me ziplining down the Ten Commandments. Have I allowed human respect to keep me from giving expression to my faith? Have I helped someone overcome a difficulty against the faith? If I read this superficially, I'm going to think it's a silly and superficial examination of conscience. But it's not. There's tremendous depth to this examination of conscience. And because it's different than the examinations of conscience that we're used to making, there's tremendous value in using it because it's kind of shifting gears, putting ourselves into a different perspective. And so then we're able to recognize otherwise hidden sins that we would have continued on with. Right. And Robert Bellarmine on the Sacrament of Penance, there's this great quote 
Alas, what have I done, miserable man that I am, in committing such a crime? I have offended my most bountiful father, the giver of all good things, who hath loved me so much, who hath surrounded me on all sides with benefits, and so many proofs of this love do I see, as I behold myself or others in possession of such benefits. But what shall I say of my Savior, who loved me even when his enemy, and delivered himself from me an oblation and a sacrifice to God for an odor of sweetness? And I am so ungrateful as still to offend him. How great is my cruelty! My Lord was scourged, crowned with thorns, and nailed to a cross, that he might apply a remedy for my sins and offenses, and still I cease not to add sin upon sin. He, hanging naked on the cross, exclaimed that he thirsted for my salvation, and I still continue to offer him vinegar and most bitter gall. Who will explain to me from what height of glory I fell? when I committed such and such a sin. I was heir to an eternal kingdom, a life of eternal happiness. But from this great happiness, the greatest that can possibly be possessed, I unhappily fell for a short passing pleasure, or for certain offensive words, or blasphemous language against God, which did me no good whatsoever. And to what estate have I come, having lost that happiness? To the captivity of the devil, my most cruel enemy. And as soon as the putrid carcass of my body shall be dissolved, which may be any moment then, instantly and without remedy, shall I descend into hell. It's good to be afraid. Like, God's love isn't fickle. God's love is deep and enduring. And by learning to unpack the scary situations that we've gone through in our lives, the trying situations that we've gone through in our lives, we learn to recognize His fatherly love. And the more that we recognize it, the more our heart is animated by it. The more that our heart's on fire and it just animates everything that we do. And the more that we recognize that's all that we want. And sin is horrifying in comparison. And so then we can apply ourselves more vigorously to making a good examination of conscience so that we can make good confessions. Especially right now while the churches are closed, we have lots of time to devote to meditation on our lives and on the sins that we tend to be drawn close to most often, the sins that we most regularly commit, and to unpack those and ask why. And ask if God is offering us something better. For your homework, I gave you two chapters from the treatise on the love of God. Chapter 8, how much God desires we should love him. And chapter 9, how the eternal love of God prevents our hearts with his inspirations in order that we may love him. The, uh, I want you to read these. I want you to read all the readings as, as time permits. And I want you to respond honestly. What did you think? Did any of this force you to think about anything different? What was the most challenging reading to you? Why? What was the most enlightening reading to you? Why? What do you think of Johan Hari? I'm looking forward to hearing your input, and I'm looking forward to sharing this discussion again. Thank you, and God bless you, and stay safe, and soon we'll all be able to be together in this beautiful church.